our Android team at Yelp. Uh, we're going to talk about continuous integration, uh, mostly with respect to Android, but we'll touch on some things that are not necessarily Android specific. Um, so first, a little bit about Yelp. So our mission is to connect people with great local businesses. For me, that's usually like late night dinner plans when I didn't sort of plan in advance. I want to find a good place to eat. Uh, or sort of more importantly, when I need to get like really good professional services that I'm going to spend a lot of money on. So like a plumber or an electrician or a home inspector, um, Yelp is sort of my go-to place to find that business and uh, spend my money with them. Uh, so some numbers that might be kind of interesting uh, about Yelp. So we have 97 million uh, monthly active users on mobile. We also have 115 million reviews across uh, all 32 countries that we currently support. And 74% of our searches are done on mobile. This is sort of emphasize that we're a mobile focused company. And so building a high quality Android app is super important to that mission. Uh, so first, before we get into CI, I just want to remark that like software engineering is super expensive. Um, in order to get hired, you need to be sourced by someone. You are going to talk to a recruiter and spend time with them. They're going to set up meetings with engineers to do interviews. They might fly you on site. They're going to pay for a hotel and food and all that fun stuff. Uh, so that can get pretty expensive. Um, not only the fact that you are going to have a salary, you're going to have stock, you're going to have medical and dental and all that fun stuff, PTO days, sick days, office hardware, you're going to, your employer is going to pay for electricity and internet. And all this sort of summarizes the fact that your time is super valuable. Uh, the time that you spend working um, need, is very important and you need to make sure that you're uh, spending your time wisely. Um, so, uh, one thing I like to think about is that the earlier in a process that you catch mistakes, the better. So when you're coding, if you write something and you get told of your mistake right away, say like in Android Studio, um, that's going to save you a lot of time than if you have to compile and wait a couple of minutes to learn that you misspelled hash map or you didn't capitalize something properly. It's going to cost you a lot, um, and so it's better to catch these mistakes early. Um, thinking about the process a little bit bigger, if you wait until production to find issues, you're, you're going to have a rough time in that you've had a whole engineering team work on solving this problem, writing maintainable code, uh, writing tests and getting everything ready to go. And if you launch uh, this thing to users and you decide, nah, maybe we shouldn't have written this at all, um, you don't have wasted a ton of resources. You also have this opportunity cost loss where you could have worked on something that's more valuable to your users. Um, so in that instance, if you can solve these problems in the design phase, you're going to save a lot of time and money. Um, so I like to think of things in sort of this like exponential curve um, of cost. So the sooner you find issues, the better, um, even before development. So there's this phase where you can save a lot of uh, time and energy by finding issues before development. Then there's this sort of uh, area between where you should start using continuous integration and where you can use other tools to help you save time and money. Um, and then CI is sort of like this defense um, where you find things before they go out to users. Um, so it might seem kind of weird that I'm here to talk to you about continuous integration, um, but I'm also telling you that maybe it's not the first thing that you should set up. Um, but there's a lot of things that can save you time and that maybe you should have before you uh, focus on adding uh, CI to your setup. Um, so code reviews is one uh, tool you can use. So you definitely want to make sure that you have some sort of process where you have other engineers reviewing each other's code. You're going to get good knowledge sharing out of this and you're going to kind of uh, you have sort of a platform uh, to make things happen throughout your process. So we'll talk a little bit about how we use code reviews um, to enforce things that happen with CI um, a little bit later in the talk. Um, static analysis, uh, you can sort of use static analysis to leverage uh, decades of computer science knowledge to find issues that maybe you don't realize are issues um, before they even surface. Um, and generally, static analysis on your code is going to be super fast. Um, so this is definitely something you should look into. Uh, code style is important. Even if you're working on a project on your own, um, it's good to have a consistent style that you uh, conform to. That way, when you go back and fix things, you're not working with some style you used to use like six months ago. Um, so definitely good to have this. And uh, as the slide says, bonus if you have sort of an auto formatter. So at Yelp, for our Android team, we use the Google Java code formatter. So we don't worry about how our code's formatted. We just let that handle it. And we no longer talk about this in code reviews, which has been pretty beneficial for us. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so having good tools, also important. Before you have CI, you should know how your uh, IDE works. 
Um, so if you find yourself clicking around a lot, that's probably a good sign that you should spend time practicing maybe 15, 30 minutes a day, making sure that you have a good grasp of your tools. This are gonna pay dividends down the road for you. Um, even if you don't think you're gonna use this tool in a couple of years, uh, it can be pretty valuable to just understand these patterns that IDs have that you can apply in the future. So if you know that you can automatically format with like a keystroke, you're gonna look for that in your next ID. Um, so that can be pretty good. Um, one last thing that I'll touch on, and we could probably do this kind of forever, there's a lot of things that you can do to have good development practices, um, and that's retrospectives. So if you're working on projects and they complete, then you just jump onto the next thing. You're missing like a treasure trove of knowledge for uh, things that you did well, things that you um, may be able to do better in the future. So definitely recommend sitting down with someone, even if it was a solo project, sort of doing a retrospective to make sure that you learn everything you can out of a project. Okay, so I've been rambling probably for like five or seven minutes about different things and we haven't even touched on continuous integration or what it is. Um, so we'll sort of start with a definition. Um, so in general, develop our continuous integration is not like server or software that you use. Uh, it's a development practice. Um, so use a shared repository um, to automate builds and then you can do some quality assurance on that build. So like running stack analysis that we talked about or running tests um, and that's what CI can do for you. Um, but that's what CI is. Uh, there's also this extension of continuous integration uh, called continuous deployment. So we're not really going to talk about continuous deployment. It is a very valid practice and people on Android uh, do continuous deployment, though it's a little more rare. You'll commonly see this on web. Um, and basically the idea for continuous deployment is as soon as things pass all your tests and everything, you automatically deploy this to your users uh, straight away. Um, so when you're pushing to master, you're actually pushing to users. Uh, so pretty cool. if you find CI interesting, definitely recommend checking out continuous deployment. We're not going to talk about it here, uh, but definitely worth looking into. Uh, cool. Also want to note that continuous integration in general is pretty hard to do and to do right, and especially on Android. Um, so why is it hard and why is it hard on Android? Um, emulators can be kind of tricky to work with. Um, so if you're running UI tests, you're going to need emulators and getting these to work on Jenkins or CircleCI or something can be kind of tricky to get right. Things have gotten a lot better over the last couple of years, especially with the speed improvements for like your regular emulators. You also have multiple options like Jenny Motion. Um, uh, so things are difficult, but they're also getting better. Um, tooling has been far from perfect, so it used to be the case that it was very, very hard for us to set up CI. Things have gotten a little bit better where it's easier and things are, uh, there's more things that are available to get you going, um, but in general it's still hard to get things working the way you want. You might have to clutch things together, um, but uh, so having tools be more mature would be helpful, but it's not. Um, setting up the Android SDK, sometimes kind of hard even on your own development laptop. Sometimes you just set it up and try to build the app and it just doesn't work. At least that's our experience at Yale. Maybe we should fix some things with our setup. Um, but getting this setup on CI can be even more of a challenge, especially when you have to take into consideration that the SDK changes and it, uh, over time you need to maintain it and keep it updated. And if you don't have an automatic way to do this, this might be kind of a pain, especially if it's uh, split among different nodes. Um, flaky tests. This is not something that's specific to Android, um, but if you have a flaky setup for your CI server, it's going to be very difficult for your developers to trust um, the results that they see. So if something fails, they're not going to think that they, they're the ones that are responsible for it. They're just going to rerun things or um, maybe not fix it at all because things are too flaky. And fixing flaky situations, kind of difficult, not always obvious how you can make things uh, work. Uh, so this can be a, a big difficulty when setting up CI. And sort of lastly, um, if a build fails and it's not clear to your engineers why things have failed, or even if it's just not clear to you, you're going to spend a lot of time going through logs and XML files and uh, different things trying to figure out what happened, when all you want to know is why did this fail? Was it a test failure? Was it a stack analysis failure? Um, make those things obvious. You need to make things obvious, but it can be kind of tricky to do that. And also notifying people about results. So when something goes bad, how do you notify your engineers that something went wrong? Do you ping everyone on IRC? Do you send out emails? Do you text them? Do you wake them up in pager duty? These things are not necessarily obvious, um, depending on your situation, and it can be kind of tricky to get this right. So it's something that makes uh, CI kind of hard. Uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit about Jenkins. If you hate Jenkins, don't worry about it. 
Um, there's still going to be valuable things in the stock, I hope, for you to take away. Um, but just know that we're going to touch on Jenkins, and if that's a sore spot for you, I'm sorry. Jenkins can be kind of tricky. But also, I'm not here to sell you on Jenkins. There's a lot of offerings out there. Use what works best for your team. Explore the options that are available, and you can make the right decision. I'm not going to tell you what to do. Cool. So I think a brief introduction of CI Yelp will be really helpful. Um, so this will show you sort of our very humble beginnings. Um, and then we'll walk through what we did and where we are today. And I think today we have a pretty good setup, uh, which I'm pretty happy to talk about. Um, so I think this might be useful for people. Uh, so the beginning of Yelp was that we had we we created an Android team out of nowhere, and we just needed to ship product really, really quickly. So we were trying desperately to get up to feature parity with iOS and make sure that uh, we had all the things that they had and even more. We were very ambitious, and so shipping very quickly was uh, something that was important to us. The tooling was also hard to set up CI, um, so it became this really big cost to try and get things set up, and then the aspect of trying to maintain CI to get things to work properly was like kind of expensive for us, so we decided that this wasn't something we wanted to do. Not that that was necessarily the best decision, but that's how things went. Eventually, we wanted to do start running tests and get CI set up. Um, basically, the rest of Yelp had a very, very mature test-driven development setup, and they, they ran CI, and they did all these great things, and they, had all these, they would always talk about these positive qualities, and we knew as engineers that this was probably a, the right direction for us to go eventually, so we decided to run tests ourselves. Um, so this was our initial setup. Uh, essentially, we had a single Mac Pro that would run everything for us. This was our static analysis, uh, running regular JVM tests, running UI tests, uh, building APKs, uh, everything that we needed, uh, the single Mac Pro did it. Uh, we were able to get four emulators running on it before we saw diminishing returns. So basically, our tests would get slower if we added a fifth or sixth emulator. Uh, so four, for whatever reason, was a magic number. Um, and we were able to use these four emulators to shard all of our UI tests. So UI tests can be pretty slow, so we decided to run or split up our set of tests and have them run on each emulator. Um, so this got us some pretty good speeds. And we were pretty happy about this. Um, however, you can only run one test read at a time. So if three or four people want to run te the tests at once, they now had to wait for each other. And this was okay at first because, sorry, uh, things were pretty fast. Um, and so queuing up wasn't a big deal. Uh, eventually we started adding tests as part of our code review process. Uh, so I mentioned before that having code review is very important. Um, and so we were able to leverage this to get people to start writing tests. Because if you just start asking people to write tests, you know, they need to get their feature out. They might not necessarily do it. So leveraging this in code review is really important. So we would ask people not only to run the tests and link to it in their code review, we would also get them to write tests if it made sense for their feature. Um, and people really like doing this. You can sort of imagine that if other people are going to run your tests, you're more incentivized to write tests yourself because you know that people in the future aren't going to come down and break your feature. You need to come in to fix it because you're responsible for it, even though someone else broke it. Um, so this is sort of like this nice symbiosis we could get uh, with engineers to sort of work together a little bit better, even if it's more indirect. Cool. So we got really, really good at writing tests, and our team also started getting a lot bigger. So these two things worked in tandem together, um, and we essentially got test runs that took us 45 to 60 minutes. Um, and as I said, only one person could run tests at a time, so if three people were in the queue, the last person's not going to see any test results for like three hours. And uh, we had a very flaky test run. I sort of talked about how bad flakes can be. Um, if one of your tests flaked, you now had to rerun your tests, and you just hope that you know in those three hours nobody else decided to run tests. So this was pretty bad. Um, we realized this long before it got to this got this bad, and we decided that it was time to scale. And this is the architecture that we more or less came up with, and that we use today. Um, so essentially, we have uh, our Jenkins set up or your CI set up using uh, AWS machines to do the majority of our work. So this builds our APKs, this runs our static analysis, and does our regular JVM tests, and we'll touch on these a little bit in the future. Um, and then we use Firebase Test Lab to do all of our emulation needs. So that's basically all of our UI tests. Um, so, be, so just to touch a little bit about each of these in a little more detail, so Jenkins handles everything except emulators. Um, and it has uh, basically a split between CPU-heavy AWS machines and RAM-heavy machines. So making the difference between these two isn't super important, um, but it's kind of an optimization you get to make. And we'll sort of talk about what jobs use each of these and why. Um, but if you're setting this up yourself, you don't really need to worry about either of these things necessarily. 
Uh, one thing I wanted to call out about Jenkins um, and just about CI in general is that if you can source control how your builds operate, so what steps need to run and um, how, how each of your different jobs does things, uh, I highly, highly recommend this. So for Jenkins, this is something called the Jenkins Job Builder. Um, you can use this to write YAML files that will describe how your builds run. Um, this gave us a lot of quality in how we actually set up continuous integration. Um, so one issue we had was that we used to run everything through the Jenkins web UI. So essentially what this meant was that anyone could at any time or anyone who had access could change jobs and there was no sort of history or record that this was happening and people would break things without realizing it and other people would see these failures and it just was not a good situation. So now we source control everything um, with the Jenkins job builder and you know, life is a lot better. We can sort of have all the processes we have with writing regular code and now it's part of uh, how we build CI and how we expand things in the future. It's also a great way to share knowledge when you make a change, now other people can see how things change. Um, so we've got a lot of value out of source controlling builds. Uh, so a little bit about our Firebase test lab setup. Um, this is the part that handles all your emulator needs. Uh, getting Firebase test lab set up is super easy. Um, probably if you decide to set up an account and try and get things running, it'll probably take you an hour or so to start running your tests on emulators, uh, which is pretty great. Um, so you, and their documentation is pretty decent. Um, but sharding can take a lot of work. So as I said before, we sharded to these four emulators. We sort of took a similar architecture um, where uh, basically for every test class, and you don't necessarily need to do it this way, but we, our focus was on speed. For every test class, we start up an emulator. Um, so we run hundreds and hundreds of emulators every time someone runs uh, run a test suite. And this isn't handled by Firebase <coughs> Test Lab uh, specifically, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later, um, but essentially it's not uh, drag and drop ready, but you can actually do sharding if you want. All right, so what did this architecture get us uh, at the end of the day? So now we have this hard upper limit um, of 20 minutes to get test results. So regardless of how many people are running tests or how many tests that we've added, you're pretty much guaranteed to get your test results in 20 minutes. You can get them faster in about nine or 10 minutes, um, but because of some architecture reasons, a lot of times this ends up being 20. Um, so I'm fairly confident that if we double the number of tests tomorrow, maybe while I'm giving this talk, some interns are working really hard, um, I'm pretty sure we'll still get 20 minutes test results. Um, and also now we can run parallel test runs. So no matter how many engineers are running tests, you can go in and start running your tests. You don't need to wait and queue up behind anyone. Um, you just get to run things right away, which is really nice. Uh, so I think it'll be useful to walk through a couple of our CI's responsibilities and sort of the different jobs that we have. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about how we build APKs and get that to scale to multiple machines, um, running uh, UI tests, uh, something I call checks, which we'll talk a little bit more about, and then a very important job uh, called the merge job. Uh, so first, a little caveat. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Docker in the next couple of slides. If you've never worked with Docker, don't worry too much about that. No need to panic. Um, Docker is a super, a, a really cool technology. I definitely recommend checking out. Essentially, what you need to know for this talk is that it allows you to configure an environment. So something that maybe has an Android SDK or has some software uh, that you need installed, like the Google SDK or something, or the Cloud SDK or something. Um, and then you can take that configuration and copy and paste it onto different machines, and then you're running in that environment. Um, and maybe you, as we step through examples, it'll make a little bit more sense. Cool, so building APKs is very CPU intensive. Um, so we use AWS machines that have a lot of CPU, uh, but maybe not so much RAM. Um, although building APKs can take quite a bit of RAM as well. Um, but essentially we focus on using CPU machines. Uh, we also build a Docker container that has everything that we need. Um, so this has uh, a lot of uh, different components that are specific to the Yelp setup. Um, and we're also considering open sourcing this just as like a small little thing that uh, people can use to build on. Um, but we built ours off of this Uber open source Docker file, which essentially gives you the building blocks to uh, set up your own Docker container. So if you check out this repository, you can use this to start building apps with the Android SDK uh, without having to do any sort of configuration yourself. And you can kind of add on this uh, to do uh, things that you want with that are required for your build. Um, Running tests on Firebase Test Lab for us takes a considerable amount of RAM, and the reason for that is that we 
kind of as I said before, we try and parallelize everything. So every single test class has its own uh, emulator that's associated with this. And there's no way to tell Firebase Test Lab, at least at this point, like, hey, start up these 300 emulators and chart all my tests with these emulators. We basically have to go, we, we basically start up a process for each emulator that we want. We say, here's your test class, please run the, the APK and test on this uh, emulator. And then uh, we ping it every X number of seconds saying, hey, are you done running our tests? Um, this takes a lot of RAM, it's like four megabytes for every test class. Um, so you can see how this explodes really, really fast if your test suite is uh, of any sort of large scale. Um, we also use a Docker file for this, probably not worth us to even open source this in any way. We basically just use the Google Cloud SDK Docker file, um, and then we add a little bit of authentication on top of that for our, for our container. Um, so you can just take this and start using uh, Firebase Test Lab. Um, it's pretty simple to do that yourself. Cool, so we have something called the checks job, which is sort of just this amalgamation of a whole bunch of things that we do that are both fast to do and um, uh, do some pretty important stuff for us. Uh, so one thing that we do is use PMD. Uh, so this is a static code analyzer for Java files. Um, I don't think PMD really stands for anything. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong about that. Uh, I couldn't find a backronym and there was nothing on their website. So it's just called PMD. Um, find bugs, very similar to PMD. They both sort of, they cover some of the same area and they find some of the same bugs, but together they find a, uh, an even larger uh, set of uh, issues that come up. <coughs> find bugs differs from PMD and that does not look at your Java files. It looks at the actual bytecode that is generated from your Java code, uh, which is pretty, pretty cool. Um, be fascinating to like dig into the details about how that works. Um, essentially, we use both of these things to find issues um, before uh, uh, merging code or before putting things up for code review because they run really fast. We also don't find a whole lot of use out of check styles anymore. We used to use it a lot. Um, basically, what this allows you to do is set up rules for how your code should be styled. Um, it's pretty configurable, and you can almost you can do a ton with it. Um, but now that we automatically format our Java files, it's not so useful for us. But I thought I'd mention anyways, in case you're not willing to automatically format your files or you're not able to for whatever reason. Um, we also do uh, Android Lint as part of our checks job and then also unit tests as well. Uh, these are just like a regular fast Java test. Uh, the last job that we'll talk about is our merge job. Um, so this job is pretty important for us. Um, essentially what it means is that whenever someone pushes to uh, a git branch that starts with i slash, the merge job will look for that and then rebase it on top of master and then run the, basically run the checks job on top of that. And if that passes and there was no merge conflict or anything, um, then it will automatically merge your branch into master. Um, it will also close out your code review and comment on it saying, hey, we've merged your code to master or your release branch it doesn't have to be master, it can be an arbitrary branch as well. Um, so this job is pretty simple, and it might be kind of um, tricky about what it's actually giving us, but, but essentially by introducing this job, no one is allowed to push to master anymore, or they're not allowed to push to release branches. Um, and essentially this has given us a ton of quality on top of master. So it's a pretty rare thing now that our master branch is broken or has broken tests, um, other than UI tests, and we'll say we don't run UI tests just because 20 minutes is a pretty long time. Um, but we will also run UI tests in the future if we're able to get that time down. Um, but getting stability on master is super, super important, um, especially as your team grows. Even if you only have a couple of developers, if you push something and it breaks the build, but you don't necessarily know it does, maybe it just breaks some tests, um, and then someone pulls that and is basing their feature off of it, even if you went and fixed it, they don't necessarily know that you fixed it. So now they're in this situation where they go to run tests on their own code, and things are broken, and now they're spending time investigating it, trying to figure out how their code broke this very unrelated test. And they're like really happy that this test broke because unrelated tests are great um, because it means something really messed up has happened that you want to fix. But really, nothing has happened. You just pushed this change on master, and he's now very or he or she is very upset about this. Um, and as your team grows, this situation, this situation, and other similar situations happen with more and more frequency. So doing things like this. Uh, to ensure quality on your master is super important. Although this isn't the only thing you can do to do that. Cool, so by working on CI, what are some things that I learned? Um, as I mentioned before, source control your builds. If your CI supports this, definitely do this. 
Um, and also just source control everything. Like if you're working on a Docker file to run the Android SDK, don't just like write it on your laptop and then upload the container somewhere for people to use or your CI to use. Put this in source control, make sure that it's code reviewed and it's part of your good development practice and so that everyone knows what's happening and they can go back and rebuild it if they need to. Um, so this is super important. Definitely source control everything. There, if you, if you don't really have an excuse to not source control things. It's very cheap and it gives you a lot of quality. And also, outsourcing infrastructure is amazing. If we didn't have something like AWS or Google Cloud Compute or any of these types of services, I would still be working with engineers trying to get something set up so we can have our CI working and scale to the needs of our team. Um, so having that available makes this a lot easier. We don't have to have hardware engineers who are maintaining a data center necessarily. We can just offload this work to people who do a really great job at it, and we can just focus on solving problems that are important for our business. And also uh, worth calling out Firebase Test Lab. I mean, if I had to get emulators working on AWS machines, um, I mean, that would probably be a really interesting problem to solve, but it's not something that is necessarily core to what I want to do. Um, so while it would be interesting, definitely has saved a lot of time. This and uh, reinforces my point that outsourcing infrastructure is really awesome. Cool, so what are some things that maybe I or Yelp is thinking of for Android's continuous integration in the future? Um, tricking Firebase into supporting charting would be really nice. Um, not having to maintain this part of our infrastructure would be great, and we'd probably save a lot of resources and money just having them do it on their side because they're using those resources already. Um, Auto-scaling AWS machines. So right now, um, our set of machines on Jenkins is fixed, and we scale these up or down manually ourselves. Um, we've only done this once since we introduced this architecture. We probably won't do it for a while, um, but this would be something that would be nice to auto scale up and down based on our needs. Now we're saving money. Right now we just have these machines sitting up there consuming money, even though no one is working on those right now. Maybe some people on Hamburg, I don't know. Um, also detecting flakes and surfacing these better. We don't do a great job with this at Yelp, um, at least on the Android team. So being able to detect tests that have been flaking frequently and giving developers tools to solve flakes um, really, really well uh, would go a long way to making our test times not 20 minutes, but maybe 10 minutes instead. Uh, and cool. Just to summarize, uh, by adding CI, code reviews are a lot nicer. Um, there's also other things that make code reviews nicer that I didn't get into. Um, but essentially, by introducing these things that give you quality, um, we focus code reviews more on like high level things that are important that engineers need to figure out rather than sort of fussing over a code style or trying to get formatting correctly or silly things like that, just, just sort of waste our time. Um, now master is really broken, I just touched on that a lot, but this is super important, especially as your team scales. You definitely wanna get that right. Uh, tests, we can scale them out. The number of tests we have and the number of people running tests, uh, we do that portion manually by spinning up more AWS machines. Um, I just want to emphasize that we went in a very short amount of time, probably only two or three months, from running four emulators to running hundreds for every single test suite. And typically we have uh, a lot of people running tests at once, so we're essentially running thousands of emulators at a time, um, which is quite crazy to think about. I don't know how we do this on our own hardware. Um, uh, but yeah, I just want to call this out because I think that's really, really cool. Awesome, so if you found the content of this talk interesting, highly recommend the Yelp Engineering Twitter account or the engineering blog. I'll be following up with a blog post that sort of details more how you can actually set this up, um, although I'd be happy to answer any questions from people, uh, either here or online if you can find me. Um, also, if you're looking to make a career change, Yelp is always hiring, probably goes without saying. Um, cool. Yeah, thanks for your time, and hope you enjoyed the talk. So what kind of hardware you are using to run uh, so many emulators? Uh, so we use a service called Firebase Test Lab. So there are Firebase is, owned, is a team owned by Google. Um, so they basically offer your disability for you to be like, hey, start me up these emulators mm -hmm. and then you can run tests on them. Did I understand well? Uh, I'm not familiar with Jenkins. Yeah. Uh, did you do source control with Jenkins? Yeah, so Jenkins has something called the Jenkins Job Builder, which is uh, basically a uh, you can write YAML files to configure how your jobs run, and then basically you can source control that. So you basically compile them, and that's your configuration for Jenkins. 
So you don't use Git, yeah? Uh, so we do use Git. Uh, oh. So Git is what we use for source control. Oh, okay. Um, we just basically put Jenkins into Git. And oh, okay. So instead of just code, uh, it's now just YAML files. I have a question. So you yeah. run Firebase test engine, and after you do all the emulator tests, how do you get the test results back? Yeah, so every time we start up an emulator, we're maintaining a network connection open uh, to Firebase Test Lab, because okay. uh, it's running on their hardware, which is like over the internet. Um, so when they tell us that they're done, we just go into the bucket. Uh, so you, you get a bucket when you connect to them, um, and then we just download the test result XML or the log pad or a anything really that we want that they provide. So it can be integrated something with Git Shack, something like that? Um, I'm, Sorry. Like Is like that there are integration messengers, right? Like where it can integrate it to yeah. like HipChat and like flash in HipChat like that. It can uh, spit out all the test results. Uh, yeah, so you can hook that up. Okay. So you just get all these XML files and you can do whatever you want. Oh, okay. Um, so you can pipe them into your own custom thing that you wrote or you can use them with it sounds like you can use them with HipChat. Okay. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but uh, yeah, you can do whatever you want with the results. Okay. Same as running them locally. Yeah. The Firebase for Smart Home setup managing yeah. hundreds of emulators. Yep. Sounds expensive. <laughs> what uh, kind of pricing are we talking about? Yeah, so Firebase Test Lab is $1 per hour for emulators and $5 per hour for physical devices. So you have the option to run on either. We just run on emulators. So, um, so their pricing model is based on how long your tests run. Okay. So all the time that it takes a setup and shut down and like grab the results and store things in Google Cloud and storage, all of that is not part of the pricing scheme, it's just when your tests start running to when they stop. So if your tests take half an hour, then you're gonna pay for half an hour for every test week. So one, time, one, one emulator, one dollar, you're saying one hour? Um, one it's like your total test time. So right. if we take two hours to run all of our tests, whether that's on one emulator or 500 emulators, it still costs us, uh, I don't remember what number I said, uh, but the dollar per hour, that's yeah, so two dollars. You mentioned at the beginning that uh, why uh, continuous integration is hard. Yep. You mentioned one of the points where uh, SDK setup is hard. What yep. do you mean by that? Uh, so it's like it's difficult to download the SDK and unpack that and get it to run and build your app uh, some of the time. So it can be kind of a painful experience for you or it can be very difficult. Um, even if you're just sort of setting up on your own laptop, sometimes you need to go and configure things. Um, then if you think about like distributing this to a whole bunch of different machines, um, if we weren't using Docker, we would have to like basically set up each machine to have the Android SDK and then make sure that they're all up to date. Um, so Docker is great for that because we can just configure basically like one thing and then we have uh, a setup that's the same everywhere. So when you're talking about configuration, you mean uh, Docker? So, yeah, I mean there are other, I'm not familiar, that's why. Yeah. So there are other things that you need to configure with the SDK besides Docker or? Uh, yeah, so, um, Docker and the SDK are kind of separate concepts. Maybe I should just leave yep. Docker alone for now. Um, but like for building the Yelp app, we need more than just the Android SDK. There's a bunch of different tools that we need in order to get things to work. Um, so just making sure that all of those set up is okay. important. And also keeping everything up to date. Do you download screenshots? What's that? Do you download screenshots? Yeah. Uh, so our iOS team does that, and they basically do like a binary diff between screenshots, and they found that extremely painful. Uh, so they end up with like a lot of false positives, so they end up, so like it'll trigger, like, hey, this test had failed because these two screenshots aren't the same, and then an engineer would have to go and look at them, or our product manager or something, and they would go, <laughs> oh, it's just like a little pop-up that came up, or uh, notifications, so the time was different, or like something like that. Um, so they found a lot of false positives and it's been, they're sort of like migrating away from doing that. Um, but just having screenshots in general, I think would be valuable. Yeah. Um, I we had someone looking into that, but we don't actually do that right now, but I think it's an option with Firebase Test Lab. But don't quote me on that. So what do you host internally? So you've got the build process, like running on Amazon servers, and you've got yep. the, the Firebase through the UI testing. Yep. So do you host anything? Um, so we don't use any of our hardware for Android to run any of our tests. We run everything on AWS. Um, so even like our web backend runs on AWS, for example, and all of their testing infrastructure as well. 
Yeah, you want a question? Uh, Docker, so what is all included in the image that you're taking? Um, so obviously, you're not doing the full clone of what, you know, the operating system and everything, right? Or yeah, so Docker basically has like an Ubuntu, uh, like a Linux Ubuntu setup, and then you can install things in it. So if you're familiar with uh, Linux distributions, you can use AppKit to like install things as part of Docker. So your Docker file will define like AppKit install all the packages that you want. And so it is fresh, fresh OS. Yeah, okay. yeah. So yeah, whenever you build your container, that's what you have, um, and then when you run things on it, your container is just destroyed after that. So when you run things again, you have like this fresh setup that's the same as the first time you did it. It's just like having a virtual machine with a snapshot. Right? Yeah, essentially. Yeah. Um, yeah. It is also using virtual machines as well, depending on where you're running. So what IDEs are you using? Uh, I just use Android Studio and Sublime Text. Um, so I don't write that much Android code anymore since I work on this stuff. So it's a lot of bash scripts and Python scripts. Do you know uh, Eclipse is it is used in uh, Android development or? Yeah, Eclipse <laughs> exists. I don't know if anyone uses it anymore. I, I hope not. But I'm sure. I'm sure it's still still kicking around. What kind of frameworks do you use for your UI test? Uh, I had this question at the last talk. I wasn't really sure what to answer. Maybe I'll come up with something better. Uh, so, do you mean like do we use like Espresso? Yeah. yeah, we use Espresso, Makito, um, probably a whole bunch of other stuff. I should have come up with a good answer. After. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, I don't end up writing that many tests myself because I don't work on much application development these days. But yeah, we have Espresso and we have, you know, uh, we also use RoboElectric for some things, um, but not a whole lot right now. But is your team responsible for maintaining those technologies and like mandating that they use those for their unit tests and everything? Yeah, so uh, we basically let engineers, or we make engineers responsible for writing their own tests so we don't have like an external QA team or anything like that. So if you want to build a feature, you also write the test for it. Um, we don't like make interns do it or something. Or, uh, yeah. So at Yelp, you are uh, focusing on native development. You, you, do, you do any cross-platform or like web, mobile web stuff? Uh, we, we do have mobile web, um, but we also, like all of our clients are native. Um, so we do have some things in the app that are unfortunately web views, um, but the majority of what we do is you know, development. So you don't do like cross-platform? Uh... No, we don't have anything that's cross-platform. We have a separate like iOS team and a separate Android team, and they do everything native. Mm -hmm. Cool, any other questions? Awesome.